Well, thank you everybody for coming. We're gonna give uh, folks a few more minutes to join in um, and then we'll, we'll start with the video in just a moment. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for Second Book Day. Um, we're happy to have so many admitted students attending here today. My name is Megan Jennings, and I'm the Director of Enrollment Management at the Wayne State School of Medicine. Um, and to get things started today and sort of set the tone, the first thing we have is a brief video for you, and I'll be back after that. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you again for taking the time uh, to be with us today to learn what makes a Wayne State education unique. We know that you all are at a critical decision point in your professional lives, and we hope that the information that we share here today helps you to make the best decision for you. Um, Wayne State is a special place with a unique mission, and we're excited to welcome a class of new medical students who share our passion for clinical urban excellence. We have a great program for you today. Um, you'll learn more about the education you'll receive here, our curriculum, our clinical training, our opportunities for community engagement, and about our commitment to you, the student wellness initiatives, opportunity for engagement with student organizations, and options for financing your education. We'll also have op the opportunity for you all to hear from current students who are really the best ambassadors for the program. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. I know at this point you all are very familiar with online events, um, but as a reminder, please make sure that your full name is displayed. Um, if questions come up for you during today's event, please use the Q&A function. Um, the chat function is gonna be disabled for today. So uh, please enter any questions into the Q&A function. And we have a team of students and panelists who will be available to answer these questions during the program. All the materials that we're presenting here today, we'll send out to you after the program concludes, so please don't feel like you need to take notes. You can just sit back and engage. Um, thanks again for, for taking your time this afternoon with us. And so to start things off, I'd like to introduce our Associate Dean for Admissions and Enrollment Management, Dr. Kevin Sprague. Thank you, Megan. Um, first, I would like to congratulate you everybody for their offer of acceptance to Wayne State University School of Medicine. That was the, um, so the next biggest choice you have is which school to attend. And I'm just gonna kind of simplify it. We are a 300 student per class school in uh, downtown Detroit with the largest uh, single campus. We have over 12,000 alumni in the Tri-County area that assist with us at the med school. We're very dedicated faculty and staff. So once you make your decision where you're gonna attend med school is gonna have an impact on your professional career, especially going into your residencies. Wayne graduates do very well across the country and are sought after in the residency programs. So um, please take all this into consideration as you're making your decisions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wild Sacker. He's the interim dean of the med school. Dr. Sacker is the chair of the Department of Pathology, and he was recently appointed the interim dean, and we're, uh, he's a great asset to the school. He is nationally recognized academic pathologist with a track record of independent and collaborative net NIH funding with seminal contributions in the field of gentle urinary neoplasia and prostate cancer. Dr. Sacker, 
has been involved in numerous clinical trials as an expert pathologist. In other clinical studies, he is evaluating genetic changes and expression profiling as markers for cancer diagnosis and prognosis. In addition, Dr. Sacker is an active investigator on several funded basic science re uh, research projects on the underlying molecular mechanism of prostate tumor progression and metastasis. He's also, he has also assumed leadership roles in the profession in, in professional and community-based organizations, including the National Arab American American Association and the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services, Dr. Sacker. Thank you so much, Dr. Spray. I appreciate the introduction and especially appreciate all of you joining us uh, this afternoon. We take uh, this as a great sign of uh, your interest in the Wayne State uh, School of Medicine. We certainly welcome that. And I tell you, for someone who has been here for over 30 years, at the School of Medicine at Wayne State University. I would not trade it with any other institution. The medical school has a great deal to offer all stages of career. From your stage, looking at joining the school as students for four years, to faculty at different stages of their career, to many of our uh, brilliant uh, supporting staff and administrative leader. When you join Wayne State, you will be in the heart of a very vibrant urban city, as you know. We are integrally within the community of Detroit, the metro area, Michigan, and beyond. So our community is embedded within the medical school and vice versa. Your patients are within the community and also from more far places coming for uh, destination programs that are top ranked. Your interactions with your faculty and your residents who will, whom you will be joining as Dr. Spray mentioned, if you look at the uh, upper left corner of the screen, this is a great figure of uh, matching rates for the graduates from Wayne State Medical School into residencies. The match rate is under 93% nationally. We top that by, depending on the year, sometime between 4.5 to 5 points, which is absolutely glorious for a track record of the school. If you look at our rank in terms of our research portfolio, almost $92 million in peer-funded research and awarded about 7.5% of uh, from uh, uh, increase over five years, which is a record also for any institution. If you look at our composition in terms of diversity, this is a deeply diverse institution and in its uh, students' composition, faculty, administrator, and again, it's very embedded into the community. And we have been top ranked, matter of fact, on these aspects, our diversity and our resource portfolio. So on every level, as a long-term faculty and currently as the interim dean of the school, I can tell you, you can make a great choice by joining us at the Wayne State School of Medicine. I appreciate having you here with us this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day after this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Sacker. And welcome all of you uh, potential Wayne Warriors out here. 
Um, I'm Vice Dean of Medical Education, Dr. Richard Baker. And I want to reach out to you now to say that our admissions committee has selected all of you because they believe that you will be a physician leader. There, there are no medical students here at Wayne. From day one, you're considered a physician in training. Now, our, our curriculum here, which we call the Highway to Excellence, of course, we're in Detroit, Highway to Excellence, is built upon the concept of social accountability. What is social accountability? Social accountability is our medical school social contract to society to provide outstanding physicians who can fully address the priority health needs of the local, state, and national communities that we serve. Our mission with respect to education is to develop and graduate a cadre of physician leaders who one, are comprehensively educated to provide 21st century healthcare. That's what you would expect from any top tier medical school and that's what we do. But secondly, physician leaders who are uniquely trained to provide high quality health care in a complex, high acuity, highly diverse clinical and community environment. And that's what you expect from a Wayne graduate, a Wayne warrior. And evidently, um, people think that we meet that expectation, as mentioned by Dean Sacker, year after year after year after year, we have some of the highest match rates in the country. So if you want to pursue your dream, if you want to match into your specialty, this is a great place to do, particularly if you're focused on social accountability. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, uh, hand off to the architect of our curriculum, a nationally recognized expert, our senior associate dean of, of undergraduate medical education, uh, Dr. Sakharov. Raja Sekharov. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Appreciate a kind introduction. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here and in my turn to congratulate you on being offered a spot at this prestigious medical school. Not many, many medical schools can boast about 150 years plus uh, in, in existence. And this is one of those schools. And with history comes pride and with history comes uh, eliteness. And so you've, um, you, you're, you're here, which means you have interest in our school and it's our job today to reassure you that uh, you will make a right choice by joining us. And uh, I'll be going over some of the details of our high waste excellence curriculum that Dr. Baker uh, just explained to you. And um, we'll be going through uh, some of the themes and threads, longitudinal themes, and how you can be involved in the community and roll up, rolling up our sleeves, your sleeves, and making a difference in the community, even while as a student making a difference and learning to be a physician leader. And then uh, I'll also be um, touching on how we have programs to help you become a better teacher because as a physician in training you, and as a physician in future, you're always gonna be teaching someone something. And so we wanna instill that skill. And then uh, also the programs that we're working on in terms of coaching um, and advising and our focus on wellness and professionalism as well. So those are the things I'll touch upon as we um, go through the next few slides. Um, just as a broad overview, um, 2000 foot view of our curriculum, um, we, have, we are a four year MD program and we have three phases. And the three phases are comprised of four segments. Uh, we have a pre-clerkship phase that has two segments, segments one and two. And then uh, upon completion of that, you'll be taking your USMLE step one and then transition into the clerkship phase where uh, it's uh, the segment three. In the traditional medical school, it's called year three. And then upon completion of that, you'll be um, taking your USMLE step two CK, after which you'll be transitioning into your segment four or uh, the post clerkship phase. And just to uh, give you some details of our curriculum. So each segment in the pre-clerkship phase, the segments one and two has three main courses. Uh, so the whole segment one, you'll be learning about the normals, meaning anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, some pharmacology, immunology, all the normals. 
And then when you transition into segment two, it's abnormals, meaning you'll be learning about the same organ systems, but the pathology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, um, and the therapeutics. And um, along with that, you'll also have um, the longitudinal courses, like uh, our signature course, Population, Patient, Physician, and Professionalism, or P4, as it's widely called. And then you'll be having service learning and clinical skills. And then um, we are one of the very few schools in the country that offer electives in the um, pre-clerkship phase, meaning if you are a student who wants to go above and beyond, which is more and more important now to demonstrate your excellence in the um, era where the USMLE step one is pass fail, then this is something that you can consider. We have offered this for many years and successfully so. We have multiple electives and I'll walk you through some of the electives um, today. And then um, in addition to that, um, this second year is also the mirror image of all the, elect uh, all the longitudinal courses. And in addition, all the electives will continue in the second year as well, or the segment two as well. And then in addition to that, you'll have an early clinical experience where even before you enter clerkships, you'll be spending time in real clinics under physicians in a primary care setting where you'll be applying what you learn in clinical skills and other courses to practice under care, under observation of a clinician uh, in the second year. Throughout the second year, you'll be attending our um, ambulatory clinics in, in, in the community. And then uh, once you complete those uh, courses, uh, this will be the uh, winter break of your second year, or segment two, after which you'll be entering your USMLE step one dedicated step prep time. And then you'll have um, um, an in-depth orientation for clinical clerkships where uh, it's, um, a, it's where you'll have hands-on experience and um, uh, be prepared for your clerkships. Um, next slide, please. And then Dr. Uh, Steffis will talk about the clerkships in a minute, but I'll go through some other aspects of um, the um, curriculum. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the pre-clerkship phase is unique because this is probably the only school that you can find where you'll have um, one week off for every 12 weeks. And that was intentional because um, in, the, in the first year and the first year and the second in the, in the first segment and the second segment, you saw three major courses. Um, each course is 12 weeks long and for every 12 weeks, you'll have uh, one week off and after which you'll come back and then continue the second block and then you'll have one week off and continue the third block. And then uh, the one week is for, for you to engage in wellness and also um, to engage in synthesis uh, between each of those blocks. There are no curriculum requirements during that time. And so it's a great opportunity for you to catch up on things that you would have missed because medical school is drinking from a fire hose, as you know. So this one week has been greatly appreciated by our current students. And then um, there is also four week long break between segments one and two. Uh, that's a great opportunity for students to go back. Uh, if you are living far away from your parents, visit them, get re-energized and come back to engage in the segment two activities. Or if you have research opportunities that you left from your undergrad, that's a good time for you to go back and complete those uh, in that um, one month break. And then uh, one thing that we have moved away from um, is having uh, a single high stake exam in the courses. So all of the courses that you see has um, at least three exams. And in the first year we have more exams actually. So each no exam is worth more than 40% of your total grades, which means that a student can have one bad day and still do really well in the course and pass the course by doing well in the other exams. So that's something we intentionally did keeping your wellness in mind. And then uh, we also have uh, formal programming for students having academic challenges, meaning if we uh, identify a student very early on that the student is not having uh, adequate, pro not making adequate progress, we take them under our wings and provide resources, uh, direct resources at them, both in terms of expert assistance and upperclassmen who can uh, spend one-on-one -on -one time with the student to reteach the content and practice the content with the student. Next slide, please. And um, I mentioned about the early clinical exposure. One thing that we take pride is our state-of-the-art clinical skills center, where you'll be working with standardized patients pretty much from week one of your curriculum, actually. So you'll be um, learning to communicate with patients. Simulated, in a simulated setting, you'll be learning to take uh, a detailed history 
from in a simulated setting and make errors and learn from those errors. And then in the year two or the segment two, as I mentioned, uh, you'll be going to clinics, actually real clinics under care of under observation of uh, clinicians to practice what you learned in clinical skill and apply in real patient setting. And then we also have electives that I mentioned in pre clerkship phase that you can enrich yourself uh, if you want to go above and beyond and distinguish yourself from your national peers. That's something that we offer. In addition to that, if you have time and interest, we also have um, a whole new scholarly concentration program that I'll go into more detail. And that's something very unique, um, probably um, less than 40 medical schools or 30 medical schools in the country have this scholarly concentration program, and we are proud to be one of those. And um, in this um, post uh, George Floyd era, we, we are really proud that our students championed a whole uh, social justice curriculum. And um, we as a school are known for partnering with students to um, improve our curriculum. And um, we have a curriculum management committee that has um, formed a social justice curriculum committee as its standing subcommittee, which is really great and uh, demonstrates our commitment to social justice. And we also have a student social justice and medical education coalition which partners with faculty and administration to ensure that our curriculum really um, consistently teaches and addresses the social justice aspects. And to demonstrate our uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion that D Dean Sacker alluded to earlier, um, just this last year, we had microaggressions training for all the students across all four years, all the faculty and staff that was well received by our students and staff and faculty. And uh, one of the exciting projects that we um, did this just this last year was implemented, partnered with our School of Business right across the road here within the Wayne State University and um, offered a business and medicine elective. It was well received by our students. And this was a completely experiential learning opportunity where you'll be interacting with entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs of you know, uh, new companies, uh, <clears throat> There were uh, telehealth uh, startups that came and spoke to our students. There were you know, supply chain management um, uh, CEOs who came and spoke to our students. The students have a really good opportunity to learn about the business side of medicine beginning year one. And we had more than 30 students who uh, were selected for this um, elective. In, uh, and then for the second part of this elective, when these students transition into the second year, they'll be focusing on, they'll be learning about uh, entrepreneurship in the health uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare space. This, this business of medicine elective is offered for the first year medical students. Uh, finally, I wanted to finish with the scholarly concentrations program. This is again, uh, not very common. We are one of the few schools and we take pride in um, being one of the few schools to offer this opportunity. So uh, there are multiple entry points to the students to join a scholarly concentration program. And once you are in the scholarly concentration program, you're paired with a research mentor in any of these areas, depending upon your area of interest. You can pick any one. Uh, it could be basic or clinical science research, it could be global health, it could be medical education, it could be public health women's health or environmental health. And so uh, once you pick your area of interest, we pair you with a research mentor and you get to work with them for any period of time. As long as you complete uh, our expectations for the scholarly concentration program, you'll receive um, a special uh, notification and a recognition for completing the scholarly concentration program. And uh, if you um, uh, uh, join Wayne State University, you'll be experiencing all these great aspects of our curriculum. And we partner with you. Uh, we, we are not without flaws. I'm the first one to admit, but we are open to partnering with the students, listening to them. Actually, we are well known for partnering with the students to um, make sure that we have listening ears and to make improvements, partner with you to make those improvements, to make sure that you receive the highest quality of curriculum that uh, Dr. Baker was explaining to you about. Now it's my pleasure to hand it off to my friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Steffies, who is our uh, Associate Dean for Clinical Education, where you can learn about all the great things that you can experience in the third and fourth year. Dr. Steffies, please. Thanks very much, Dr. Rajasekharan. <clears throat> can we go on to the next slide? Um, this is an exciting day around the school, an exciting week. Um, our class of 22 is getting ready for graduation and 
Half of them are now in the residency prep course. The other half took it in March. Um, I got to spend the afternoon teaching surgical skills to our um, seniors who have matched in surgical specialties. Um, <clears throat> I taught them all different ways to tie surgical knots today. The uh, class of 23 has just started their fourth year in April, and they're doing their <clears throat> some audition rotations, some special rotations. Some of them are taking advantage of extra three months in fourth year to check out some different specialties if they're not quite sure what they want to spend their time in. Our class of uh, 24 really exciting this week. They just started their clinical clerkships in April, three months sooner than we used to do it. Um, so this is a pretty, uh, uh, like I said, exciting week for them, finding their way around the hospital. And, um, and then the class of 26, do I have that right? Class of 26 is online. We can uh, tell all this about. So it's, it's, it's exciting time at the school, very busy. So as I alluded to here, our Clinical rotations start on April 1st. So we have a, um, before the segment three, we have um, a orientation course uh, that covers a lot of things and gets you into shape. But mostly what gets you into shape for starting clinical clerkships is the curriculum that we have the first two years, uh, segment one and segment two, that not only includes all the um, science of this, but also how to uh, perform as a physician and clinical skills so that when you hit the, um, at the hospitals and the uh, clinics, you're set to go. So could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Our third year rotations go from April to April. And uh, this is the way that they are structured right now. Um, we have 48 weeks. Uh, conveniently, that gives us a week off every three months. So we have 12 weeks and then a, a week off um, that we we don't want you to do, be doing anything. We want you to be resting and recharging because clinical experience gets pretty intense. We have 12 weeks of medicine and 12 weeks of surgery. Um, included in medicine is a, a month of ambulatory internal medicine. Included in surgery is uh, specialty care and anesthesia. We have six weeks each of pediatrics and OB-GYN. That is our, uh, another 12 week block. And then we have a 12 week block of one month rotations in family medicine, psychiatry, uh, in neurology. Throughout the course, we have what's called the CRISP course, um, Clinical Reasoning, Integration, and Skills for Practice. This is a longitudinal course that um, currently meets uh, one afternoon a month and goes over topics that are common to all the clerkships. Um, and that is, uh, has its own set of assignments um, and sessions, uh, including um, ultrasound experience and things like that. On the right side here, you see our clinical sites um, that we currently have students rotating at, um, and it includes um, inpatient, outpatient centers. And then we have a lot of uh, outpatient clinics um, in family medicine, pediatrics, et cetera, that are too numerous to show on this slide, but uh, um, they are also um, <coughs> integral parts of our clerkship experience. Uh, go to the next slide, please. All right, segment four, our fourth year is actually 14 months long, uh, is three months longer than usual. And the, this gives us a lot of opportunities. And this is where starting in April really makes sense. Our class of 23 is very grateful now that they've got three extra months to get extra letters of recommendation, try on some different um, uh, rotations that uh, they may not be sure what they wanna go into yet and so forth. Uh, so we have a sub-internship, and this is um, evolving since step two CS disappeared, and we are um, using this as part of our clinical skills competency uh, testing that we'll have to do in the next few years, uh, certainly for your class, to um, bring this um, information onto your residencies that you have uh, attained uh, competency and proficiency in clinical skills. Um, our emergency medicine clerkship is done during the fourth year. That's part of our core clerkship. Everybody has to take that. Um, we have a month of uh, step two prep. Um, that is a dedicated month uh, for study for step two CK. Uh, we have a one month residency prep course and that is um, roughly divided up between surgical and non-surgical specialties. And everybody takes that for a month. Um, and like I said, in March and April, right before graduation. A new thing we added last year was the TLC course, the Teaching, Learning, and Clinical Reasoning, and this is done during the year when you help teach clinical skills, and is really the um, sort of the capstone to your clinical skills, where you reach a level of excellence where you can teach those to the um, first and second year students. And we also have started a, we call it the Senior Crisp course, now the Longitudinal course, to cover topics that um, are... Uh, in the right place for fourth year, but it um, was hard to get them into a particular rotation. So these are the re required courses for the year. 
and there's plenty of time for electives, audition rotations. rotations. We have uh, over 300 different electives that are offered at our home hospitals. Um, in, we have an ambulatory setup with multi-specialties. Um, we have time for research or independent rotations. Um, and then uh, you have space to do away rotations at other schools that um, are part of the fourth year too, if you choose to. So there's a, a lot of um, opportunities and uh, extra months during fourth year to really individualize to uh, your career plans. And I think that is the end of my slides. And I'll move on to uh, introduce Dr. Eva Wainio, who, as you can see from the slide here, wears many hats at the med medical school. Dr. Wainio. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Steffies. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm here right now, although um, I have some roles in the pre-clerkship and the in the clerkship side of things representing student affairs um, because we've got a great team at student affairs that's there to support you guys throughout all four years of medical school life you know we're a we're a big school with a lot of medical students and i actually think that's one of the huge positives of uh, wayne state because we've got because of that a large group of student organizations everybody can kind of find their home within um, a, a student organization to see what you're passionate about um, and be able to meet people uh, outside of classes, volunteering out in the community and developing some of your non-medical school passions at medical school. So student life has really a, an immense program here when it comes to mentoring as well as learning communities so that you can have a smaller group that you can bond with within the, the bigger school as well. Some major events that we're excited about, um, of course, M1 orientation and the white coat ceremony. We just finished our clinician, very first clinician ceremony that got our third year class started um, just a few weeks ago and our fourth years um, for match day, which was a really, really exciting in-person uh, day where we could celebrate with them towards the end of where they got into residency. Um, so those are, those are such fun events that are like the culmination then of all your hard work throughout medical school. We have a class counselor for every single class. And something that's unique about the supportive counseling program at Wayne is that the same class counselor meets you during year one and that same person follows you across all four years. And then um, when you graduate, they start with the next group of uh, the next M1 students. So you do get to really know them and they can help when it comes to referrals for mental health. If somebody needs a leave of absence, re-entry plans, accommodations, this is the go-to person to check in with regarding what to do uh, regarding some of those needs. We do have an integrated health and wellness program that includes not only curriculum about it, but also looking at it holistically as we approach our curriculum. And we've had some major changes in curriculum over the years um, to make sure that as you're learning and as we're developing new programs, that it puts not only your learning, but your wellness in mind as we make some of these changes. And we do this hand in hand with students to be able to look at input from them regarding what would be good changes to make or good programs to continue regarding health and wellness. Our career advising has not only one-to-one -one sessions with faculty, but we've got some specialty advising dinners in the fall. Um, those, are, those are really popular for students to be able to go to a few different different fields and speak with faculty, with program directors, with fourth year medical students that are currently applying to the field and be able to see what it's all about and if it's something that you can see yourself in. And we've got some information through the AAMC Careers in Medicine as well. And then our whole goal really is to help prepare you for residency. I know you're here looking at it as like the cusp of starting into, into medical school, but we're looking at your next step already as well. And being able to look at what residency program would be a good fit for you, what specialty, and be able to prepare you all through the application season with mock interviews. So when you go to your residency interviews, you are well prepared. And that is it for me, I believe. So thank you for your attention. Good luck to everybody. Um, and next is Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones. 
Thank you, Dr. Wayne. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones. I'm an assistant professor of MedPeds, internal medicine and pediatrics in the Department of Internal Medicine. And I'm also I'm coming to talk to you all as the director of community engagement today. Next slide. Now there's so much that we would love to tell you about service learning, but I only have a couple of minutes here, so I'll give you all the short version today. But um, it's an important component of all medical school curriculum. And here at Wayne, it's really treasured. It's been a treasured part of what we do as warriors for, for decades, honestly. Um, even when I was a medical student in, in back a long, long time ago, this was important, but it was not required. So now service learning is a required component of our um, you know, building physicians to take care of us when we get older. Um, and 35 hours of service learning are required in the first and second years. So I'm sorry, component one, component one, um, trying to get away from the old lingo, but it complements the mission of the school. Um, and it really drives the mission of um, what we do in our local communities. Uh, future physicians care for medical and emotional needs of diverse patient populations. And then the next slide, you'll see a little bit more about the diversity of the people in the communities that we um, serve. And so here, when we talk about supporting our various communities, this is an example of some of the amazing work that the students, I'm sorry, future physicians used, um, did during the pandemic. And so this is just quite amazing that even in a pandemic, we continue to support our community. All of the warrior classes assisted with COVID-19 testing and vaccine distribution. Um, we work with various community agencies and we don't just work in a vacuum. We actually work in interdisciplinary teams because that's what the real world is all about, working in teams. So some of those other teams members would be um, future pharmacists, occupational therapists, nurses, uh, PAs, and actually social workers. We work with just about every professional school here at Wayne State University. There are projects that come out of the work that we do. Some are required and a part of your P4 grade. And I'll tell you a little bit about what P4 means in a moment. Um, but many students choose to take those projects on and to continue them longitudinally. The students are actually able to present at national and international conferences, able to publish papers. And I mean, this is just part of what we do being warrior MDs. Next slide. Now I just referred to P4, which is how we affectionately uh, refer to this course, which is called population, patient, physician, and professionalism. It's really everything that it takes to be a physician except for the basic sciences, but it complements the basic science curriculum. Um, it's taught in conjunction with the preclinical courses. It's actually the hands-on and in the community. Some components are taught with Cato clinical skills and the service learning grade actually is a component of the P4 grade. Now, even though you're in a class with over 300 students, really it's an opportunity to have small group learning. So the small groups are groups of no more than 15 future physicians. And usually we have clinical uh, faculty to teach the small group sessions. Uh, we have some panels that are a part of this experience, very few lectures, if any, I believe we've gotten rid of all of the traditional lectures we've had in the curriculum, but most of it is uh, small group learning that you will do with your peers. So as a student at Wayne State, this was probably the most treasured part of my experience, and it, I hope, will be a treasured part of your experience when you come to Wayne. I'm going to pass everything over to Megan Jennings now so you can learn a little bit about enrollment management. Hey everybody. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about scholarships, which I know is a uh, topic that's of uh, a lot of interest to folks. Um, so when we talk about scholarships, we, we talk about, we're talking about sort of two categories of scholarships, um, internal scholarships and external scholarships. Um, for internal scholarships, those are ones that come through the School of Medicine, either um, through institutional funds or endowed funds. And those scholarships typically are need-based, merit-based, or both need and merit-based. Um, in addition to those scholarships that come through the School of Medicine, there also are opportunities for external scholarships, 
Um, and those are those are ones that are typically based on either merit or a service component. And we'll talk about both categories of these scholarships and how you can apply for them. So next slide, please. So starting with institutional scholarships, um, we do have institutional need-based funds and you'll learn a little bit more about the exact schedule of those funds um, when some of our financial aid professionals speak in a few minutes. Um, but uh, for need-based funds, there are, is one thing for sure that you need to do, which is file a FAFSA um, because those funds are, are given out based on information that's gathered on your FAFSA. So that's, that's your role in that. Um, there's also endowed need-based funds. And when I say endowed funds, I mean, these are funds that a, a person or organization has donated to the School of Medicine, and they've given us some direction on how they'd like those funds distributed. So sometimes they say that they would like the funds to go to students who have financial need. Um, again, the way that we've learned about your financial need is by the information that you give us on your FAFSA, so you'll want to be sure to do that. And those, those um, funds are awarded by our scholarship committee. We also have both uh, institutional and endowed merit-based funds. Um, so there are some merit-based scholarships that go out to students um, using our institutional funds. And then a lot of our endowed funds also have um, a merit component as well. And uh, those, are, those are awarded through our scholarship committee. And then some of the, some of the endowed funds are both need and merit-based. So it, the, the direction that we could have from the donor would be that they would like this to go to a student who has financial need and who meets these other criteria. Sometimes the other criteria are super specific. And so if you haven't yet filled out the, um, the endowed scholarship application on academic works, when you do, you might find that you're being asked questions like, do you speak Hungarian? And what high school did you go to? Um, the reason that we ask those questions is because some of our funds have really super specific criteria um, that, and we're trying to match uh, the right student up to the criteria to get those funds awarded out. Um, so uh, for, for those endowed funds, last week you got an email uh, from us that invited you to apply for endowed funds um, using the academic work site. Uh, that application is open through this Friday. So we ask that you complete your application by Friday to be considered for any endowed funds that will go out for the upcoming year. And one of the reasons that the deadline is, is now is so that we can turn around and start um, awarding those funds and letting you know what, what funds you might qualify for. So let's move on to the next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit about external scholarships. Um, when we're talking about internal scholarships, those are, those are ones that run through the School of Medicine, but there also are several programs, um, many of them governmental, that you can apply for uh, to help pay for your medical education. Um, some of these uh, are have a merit component, but most have a service commitment, uh, where you pledge to serve in a federal program after graduation in exchange for a scholarship during medical school or loan forgiveness after medical school. Now, because these programs are external to the School of Medicine, the person who's driving, driving the car for this one is you, the student. You're the one who needs to do research on these programs to learn more about whether or not one might be a good fit for you. Um, you're responsible for looking up the application deadlines and, and submitting an application. And oftentimes, the school's responsibility is to affirm that the information that you're providing them about your, about your education is accurate, but you're the one who's going to be um, making the initial application to the program. Um, these programs are great because a lot of them really align with Wayne State's mission. Um, so that it provides you with an opportunity to serve after graduation, oftentimes in an area that has need. Um, and uh, there's a real diversity of sort of placements that you could do from serving in the armed services to serving in a rural or urban area with um, that with high with high need. So if you're interested in one of these programs, now is an excellent time to begin doing this research. Um, oftentimes, uh, you'll want to commit to it as soon as possible to ensure that the, you get the maximum benefit from the program. So I would encourage you to to look into these programs now. And so to to sum up, um, I want you to take away three things that you should be doing right now to make yourself eligible for scholarships at the School of Medicine. One is that I'd like you to file your FAFSA. 
Um, the next is I'd like you to uh, complete your scholarship application using academic works, and please do that by this Friday, April 8th. And then finally, um, research some opportunities for some of these external scholarships and see if one might be a good fit for you, um, being mindful of the, of the application process and deadlines that you'll need to, um, to apply to those. So that's information I have on scholarships, but we have more information about just your financial journey here at the med school. And so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues um, in the financial aid department, Dr. Barbara Jones and Adam Zangerly. Megan. Uh, my name's Adam. From the financial aid office and Barbara Jones is with us also. Uh, just gonna give you a brief overview of the financial aid process here at Wayne State. Uh, as Megan said, the main part of this is completing your FAFSA. Uh, online at studentaid.gov, that's step one. If you haven't done one already, you can still do it. We accept these all year long. School code 002329. After you get the FAFSA submitted, you'll get a student aid report. Wayne State is going to get the same information. And it, once we have it, um, we're going to review it and then send out our aid award letters on Academica. Those have not gone out yet to other students, to any of the students, but they will be in the next month. Um, next slide. Um, the next part of the financial aid process is to view your information on Academica. Uh, you have to accept some terms and conditions for the online process, and then you can review your aid award. Uh, primarily, the financial aid is going to be student loans through the financial aid process, in addition to any of the scholarships, grants, and private scholarships you may be eligible for that Megan touched on. Um, in addition to the standard loan, there is graduate plus loans um, that would allow you to borrow enough funds to cover tuition and living expenses for the academic year. Um, tuition charges are due. If you're not using financial aid, the uh, annual tuition charges are due in July of each year. If you are using financial aid, the tuition bill is split up into two or four payments in July um, through January. And financial aid, for people that have used it in the past, the process is similar. The financial aid pays your tuition, and if you take out enough student loans or have enough scholarships, refunds are issued to the student to cover uh, living expenses. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this chart is available on our website. Uh, this gives an indication of the amount of need-based grants that uh, Wayne State offers between two and $18,000 per year, um, depending on a few factors, mainly how much Pell Grant that you received as an undergrad student. Um, but th this is contingent on the FAFSA again, that's the main part of financial aid. Um, you can use these grants in addition to student loans and the merit-based grants to, the goal is to get enough money to cover your tuition and living expenses. Uh, next slide. Um, we advise all students that are coming in uh, to review their student aid history if they had financial aid as an undergrad student, uh, do that at studentaid.gov, same place that you can do the FAFSA. Um, log in there and you'll see your entire financial aid history. Um, next slide. Um, our next slide is about smart borrowing. We try to prevent or advise students to not borrow more than they actually need. Medical school is obviously expensive. If you add in living expenses on top of that, um, it's going to add up, obviously, or no payments are due if you're taking out loans. You don't have to pay the loans back while you're in school, um, but eventually these loans are going to have to pay back, be paid back, so uh, only borrow what you need. Uh, the Enrollment Management Office at our school does offer financial tr transition counseling to students who need it. Uh, we recommend everybody participate in this to, so that they come into medical school on the right foot, knowing what they're eligible for what is available and um, what they can expect. Uh, next slide. Some things financial aid does not cover is if you have a lot of credit card debt uh, as an undergrad student, if you had private student loans as an undergrad that are going into repayment, you can't refinance those through uh, regular financial aid. And it does not cover the purchase costs of a, of a vehicle. 
we do offer transportation expenses as part of the standard budget, but it's not allowed, we're not allowed to do an entire purchase of a vehicle. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is our contact information. We'll leave it up there for a second, then you can access this on our website, phone number, um, email. Barbara Jones and myself are full-time financial aid uh, advisors assigned specifically to the medical school. We're part of a main office for, that covers the entire university that has probably 50 staff members to covers everything from freshmen through medical school, law school, PharmD, everything in between. So we're Myself and Barbara are dedicated to the financial aid office here at the med school, and um, we're going to be your point of contact. If you have any questions, we have Zoom uh, phone appointments available uh, through our website. You can sign up for those, and uh, we'll be sure to answer all your questions. At this point, I'm going to transfer it to uh, Laura Samuelson from Enrollment Management, and she's going to take it from here. Thanks, Adam, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy that you could all join us today. So my name is Laura Samuelson. I am the Enrollment Management Coordinator for Enrollment Management Services at the School of Medicine. If we could go to the next slide, perfect. So as Adam mentioned, I do have one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, incoming students. My goal is to meet with all students uh, that are open to meeting with me about their financial transition. We go over lots of information. Um, some of it includes how to budget your refund, understanding sac satisfactory academic progress or SAP as we call it at the School of Medicine and at Wayne State. We uh, look at some educational modules for financial wellness through AAMC. Um, and we go through the things you know that financial aid doesn't cover like Adam mentioned, like credit card debt, private student loan repayment or purchasing a vehicle. We kind of troubleshoot all of the different expenses that can come up while you are attending medical school and how we will navigate those um, with you while you're here with us. So really we're here for you. Um, I'm ready to support you in any way that I can. Um, my contact information is down here for you uh, to have access to email or our website. And then on the right here, I just have a little snapshot of um, some of the materials we go over in these individualized meetings. So again, I'm here for you. Um, just reach out and set up a meeting with me and I am happy to meet with you. So now I am going to send it over to um, Dr. Krishnan. Hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, just first of all, just wanted to uh, voice now my congratulations to each and every one of you. Um, my name is Abhinav Krishnan. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions. Um, and I'm going to be proctoring uh, our Q&A session with our four medical students. Um, now, I know that you've been putting some uh, questions right here in the chat. A number of them have been answered through the entirety of our conversation and uh, presentations today. Uh, but you know what? On purpose, I'm going to keep some of those questions that we've actually contrived for you um, here so that you can really get a lot of uh, a significant glimpse from uh, what the perspective that our students hold uh, in terms of answering some of those questions. So uh, before we begin, how about we go down the line and have our med student panelists introduce themselves. So when called upon, uh, can you give us your full name, uh, what year you're in, and an interesting factoid about yourself? So how about we start with Lauren? Hi there, my name is Lauren, I'm the M1. Um, an interesting factoid about myself is in undergrad and I try to continue now, I play ice hockey, women's ice hockey, and also co-ed ice hockey. Sounds good. Um, so for number two, how about we go for uh, Marie Claire? Hi, my name is Marie Claire, I'm a third year. Um, and an interesting fact about me is um, I'm in the U.S. Army. Fantastic. Um, how about we switch over to Dan? Daniel? Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm a fourth year. Um, and an interesting fact about me is I always know what cardinal direction I'm facing at all times. That's crazy. <laughs> um, and how about, we'll say the best for last, uh, Maggie, can you please introduce yourself? Oh, stop it. Dan is definitely the best. Um, <laughs> All of you are. 
Uh, my name is Maggie or Mugda. I don't know what name is written on my screen, but uh, I'm a fourth year. And a fun fact about me is that I actually got to travel to Sydney during my second year of med school to perform in the Opera House. Yeah, so cool. And I hope we can get back to that to kind of expand on that a little bit more. Um, so uh, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, we asked you uh, beforehand for some questions that you had. And we've, as I said, put together a list for our panelists. Uh, if we're unable to get to any particular question, whether it be in the chat or uh, in our discussion today, uh, feel free to go ahead and email us at mdadmissions at wayne.edu with your question uh, so we can get that answered for you. Um, but with that said, how about we get started? So um, for our first question, I'm gonna pick an M1 and an M4. So my first question goes to Lauren and Maggie. Uh, what does a normal day look like for current students? Would you like me to start then? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, so the curriculum does tend to change year to year by a little bit, but at least for my M1 year, most of your day would be watching pre-recorded faculty lectures. So we do have requirements that COVID permitting will probably end up being in person, but anytime around that, you're free to kind of make up your schedule any way you want so that you can get in self-care and get your lectures done and kind of study on your own time. So throughout the week, there's different courses like you guys have been told where we have P4, we have Cato, um, we have volunteering going on. So sometimes those will be laid out where you'll have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, maybe one of those events, like I had Cato on Monday and then Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd have my anatomy lab and then Wednesdays and Fridays, sometimes we'd have either ultrasound or histo or some other lab where we'd meet with the rest of our group in order to supplement our learning to what we're learning in our faculty lectures. So really every day is pretty diverse and what it could bring and what you're learning at the time, it keeps it very interesting. And then the rest of that time can be filled with your hobbies and trying to keep up with all of your lectures and studying for exams. Sounds great. So Maggie, a regular day is going to the Sydney Opera House, is that what? Yeah, you know, I just fly over every day, fly back. I don't lose any time. I just teleport. Um, so yeah, I would say my first year was kind of like that, except I went to lecture every day um, because I will not pay attention to pre-recorded things. Um, third and fourth year, you wake up much earlier. Um, you go to the hospital. You, um, you know, you kind of read up on your patients and then you meet with your team for rounds and then you kind of sit around you kind of take care of things that your patients need you'll participate in like different um like didactic sessions or sometimes your residents will be like okay i want to teach you like xyz today um and then you're kind of at their mercy where you get to go home when they tell you you can go home uh, then you go home you relax a little bit i think you study a little but not nearly as much as first and second year in my opinion oh, sounds great so thank you for that um, so moving on to our next question, I'm going to open this up to all of our panelists here. Um, where do most students live and how many of you commute? So I'd say that there's a pretty good mix of people who live in like the Midtown area, which is kind of the area around campus. Um, and then some students also live downtown or in other areas of the city as well. Um, and then some students live kind of throughout the surrounding suburbs as well. Um, so I'm from a nearby suburb and I lived at home for all four years with my family, which worked out really well. Um, so there's really a good mix of like lots of great places to live. Um, and I think that it's pretty easy to get around here um, and people are able to kind of meet each other no matter where they live. Sounds good. And it seems like at most everybody concurs as well. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna move over to my next question. I think this is a really great one. And I'm actually gonna direct this to Marie Claire. Um, what is your favorite thing about being in Detroit for your medical school? It's a really good question. Um, I'm originally from California. So moving to Michigan was a little bit of a shock. I think Maggie, you're from California too. Um, yeah, so being in Detroit for med school is, is really cool for a lot of reasons. I think one of the biggest reasons for me is being in my 20s, I wanted to be able to live in a city and to have that kind of experience of being in a city, living downtown and and being able to afford it. And even as a med student, I can afford it, um, which is really different than the place that I came from. Another thing that I really like about Detroit is that 
the pathology and the people that you meet here have very different lives than what I was exposed to before medical school. Um, at Children's, I saw a lot of sickle cell crises and a lot of my colleagues at other institutions weren't exposed to that. Um, being exposed to and having the opportunity as a student to have face-to-face -face contact and be able to build a patient relationship with your patients um, to take initiative is something that's really unique about Wayne. And I think being in Detroit and having that opportunity to advocate for your patients and learn about them is, is really unique and it makes our training really, really special here. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Thank you so much for that. It's a really special, a, a lot of special experiences that I think you all go through. So that's great to hear. Um, my next question um, is, you know what, I'm actually going to direct this to everybody. So can you share what student organizations or free clinics that you've participated in? So maybe we can have one or two of you kind of chime in for this. And Daniel, maybe we can start with you. I know that you've um, actually uh, been in charge of some of our student organizations in the past. So maybe sure. so yeah, someone asked in the chat too what your favorite part about Wayne is. Um, I think this kind of ties into it. There's just so many opportunities for involvement in the community. Um, we have really, really great faculty and students who um, really create lots of great opportunities that just aren't found at other schools. Um, so I was the board of Street Medicine Detroit, um, which you may have seen on the website at some point um, during my first and second year. And then as a fourth year, I got to do a one month elective with them as well, where I went on every run, um, which was great. Um, it's a great organization that meets people where they're at and really eliminates like as many barriers to healthcare as we possibly can. Um, so I think it's a really cool model that I got to experience here. Um, I'm also involved in Student Senate, which um, Maggie is as well. Um, and other things. Um, Ascalapians too, which is a service group that um, does a lot of good stuff in the community as well. Um, so there's just so many great opportunities to get involved. It's really something that's, that's weighing apart. Um, I think we have over 70 student orgs. That's like wild. And that's a really, really huge number of things that you can get involved in here. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, perfect. So uh, how about we, just for the sake of time, I'm going to start like moving ahead a little bit. Um, so in what ways does Wayne make a large class size feel a little bit more personable? Um, how are students supported individually? So I'll open this up to everybody. I can so, start it off. Oh, oh, go ahead. So um, I think one of the best things, um, a part of my experience at Wayne was the learning community. Um, Orange 32 is like, orange is my color, 32 was my anatomy table. We're still like real tight. Um, and there's 300 people, but the six of us have kind of become really, really close friends over the past three years. And I think that, you know, you don't pick your anatomy table, but somehow Wayne kind of knows and everybody's anatomy table is friends. Everybody has a good experience. Um, and I think that that was really cool. And like as a learning community, you get to go bowling or meet up for pizza. And obviously we were doing this in 2019, early 2020, but um, even like online, we've been able to meet up and, and do things together. So even as a class of, you know, 290 or however many we are, you still are able to find really close friends. That's great. Maggie, did you want to add anything? Uh, no. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So actually, uh, no worries. So while we're actually still with Marie Claire, there was actually a question that came up in the chat um, and it was specific to Marie Claire. Um, are you in the army through HPSP? And if so, uh, what's your experience been like? Yes, I am. So I'm a second Lieutenant in the US Army Reserve. I commissioned in 2019, August 14th, um, during my first year of medical school. I applied in December of 2018. So the application process is very long. If you're considering HPSP, I would suggest you start now if you haven't started already. Um, my experience has been very positive. I um, have been able to, um, this summer I'm going to do like my training and everything. I've been able to schedule three different away rotations for my fourth year at various pediatric programs through HPSP. They are very supportive. You have uh, counselors through HPSP. You also have a counselor at Wayne. They work together and they make everything 
really accessible and easy for you as a member of the US military and as a medical student to best succeed. So if you are considering HPSP, I would 100% recommend it. It has been a great experience and I'm really looking forward to doing a residency through the Army. Thank you so much, Marie Claire. Um, so shifting gears just a little bit, uh, my question to now uh, to all panelists are also, um, what mental health resources are available to you at Wayne State University? And I think a good, I guess, um, preamble to that, I think is like a lot of those learning communities that we kind of just mentioned, but um, would someone like to kind of clarify and kind of give their impression of what mental health resources are available to them? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of really good resources here. Um, one is your class counselor who, um, like they mentioned earlier, you have the same class counselor all four years, so you'll be working with having the same person. Um, there's also CAVS, which is Counseling and Psychological Services. It's on main campus, but main campus is like a mile away. It's very easily accessible, and there's a shuttle that gets you to and from. Um, and they also do virtual appointments and things like that, too, and it's all free and covered. Um, there's also like our wellness curriculum, which Dr. Wayneo runs, um, and she does a really good job of like just having support days and things like that. Um, as a third year, one thing I can think of offhand is you get one half day off per rotation, like that you can just use for whatever you want. So you can use it to, if you're behind on studying, you can use it for that. Or if you're like, hey, I just want an afternoon off to do fun things, you can use it for that too. Um, so I definitely think the school's very good with implementing resources and things like that for wellness. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I guess this is actually kind of, um, let me uh, kind of take this from what you just said. Um, so there is a shuttle service that kind of like takes you to and fro different areas around our campus. So with that said, around campus, um, where do students typically study, like whether they're on campus or off campus? And maybe I can kind of direct this question maybe to Lauren. Lauren, what's your impressions now that you're kind of finishing up your first year? Yeah, so there are so many different places to study, and I've heard a variety from my colleagues and my anatomy group as well. In fact, once you join your anatomy group, you actually end up probably studying together quite a bit because you do become pretty close knit. I know the school just opened up a new study area near our cafeteria, and a lot of people have been flocking to it, my group and I included. It's a very nice study space. Um, a lot of people hang out in the cafeteria itself for studying because it does tend to stay quite quiet in there. Um, some people even go to the DIA in the lobby and study there as well. Um, the library, you can rent out private rooms with your group or by yourself, and there's also dedicated quiet spaces there. There are so many places to study, and some people, you can even go into the classrooms that aren't reserved for a later class or an organization and study in there as well. Also, even the computer lab is open if it's not reserved. So there are so many places you can study and with different environments for what you might need. The computer lab can be really nice if you want an extra monitor, which a lot of medical students will have multiple multiple monitors going on at once for their um, note taking and watching lectures. So there's so many options. Oh, sounds great. Thanks. Um, so how close are um, our clinical locations for our students? I know this was kind of mentioned in the chat, but maybe we can kind of echo that to all of like from all of you. Um, how close are some of those clinical locations for all of you? So I know that DMC um, and Henry Ford Children's Hospital in the VA. Those are all like right by the Wayne State campus. Henry Ford's like a little bit further away, but it's actually pretty close still. Um, St. John's is over in Gross Point, which is actually where Daniel and I live. Um, so that's like, I wanna say 15 minutes east or yeah, east. <laughs> I don't know my directions like Daniel does. Um, and then I think we have a couple of new clinical partners um, like St. Joe's. I don't know where that is though. I don't know if anyone else has insight. In Pontiac. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know where Pontiac <laughs> <It's okay>. is. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, about, I would say about like 20 minutes north of here. Um, so yeah, that sounds great. So I guess mostly like I would say like in, in short that, you know, certainly within, you know, um, I would say driving distance, like, you know, but very short, short, very short times. Um, I mean, even the Detroit River is about like, I mean, I would say like a, eight minute drive. The Canadian border is another like eight minute drive. I mean, it's it, it's very close proximity to many things that we have around here in the city of Detroit. Um, this next question that I have is really dear to my heart. So uh, what are some opportunities for research that we have here at Wayne State? 
Um, so how about um, maybe I direct this over to Daniel. Sure. So there's lots of opportunities for research here. Um, I think one difference about research in med school as opposed to like research that you've done in undergrad or in other points in your life is people tend to do more clinical based research here. Um, so it's less like bench work or like wet lab types of things. Um, so the nice part about that is it's a lot more flexible and you can kind of do it on your own time. Um, so there's definitely lots of ways to get involved in research. We have a research elective. Um, I got involved in a research project because one of my friends needed help on a project and thought that I might be a good fit for it. Um, so I did that as a fourth year. Um, there's the nice part of being affiliated with so many different health systems is you can do research with people from DMC. You can do research with people from Henry Ford and they're all, all of our uh, health systems we're partnering with are academic health systems. So they're doing research and publishing and things like that. Um, and if you don't want to go through any organized methods of doing research, you can just email like, people and say, hey, I'm really interested in your work and would love to see if you have a position open. Um, so there's lots of ways to do that. And you definitely, you're going to be busy as a med student, but if you want to do research, it's absolutely something you can make time for. Um, and I didn't get involved in research until this year and I really liked it and kind of wish I would have done a little more. Um, there's all lots of like really great poster sessions and things like that that the school puts on where you can showcase what you're working on too. Um, so they're, they're very supportive of that, absolutely. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, uh, Lauren, I know that you're doing some research. Can you kind of talk about some of the research activities that you're participating in? Yeah, so I actually got my research through reaching out via email to my PIA as well. So I knew I wanted to go into pathology one day eventually. So I actually started looking into the pathology department at the DMC and kind of connected to Wayne. Almost right off the bat, I wanted to wait to adjust to M1 first. So towards probably halfway to the latter fourth of my first year is when I started reaching out and I found a great researcher, Dr. Ali in the Department of Pathology. And I just kind of asked um, what she had going on because I knew she was involved in a lot of research, but I wasn't sure if she wanted to take on any students. And it turned out she did. So now I help with um, breast endometrial and ovarian cancer research through the Department of Pathology, also mixed in with ob -GYN. But we are also doing actually COVID research and how it affects how residents learn right now. Oh, that sounds great. Perfect. Um, I know that this, uh, and thank you for that, Lauren. I really appreciate it. I know that this question actually came up in the chat about scholarly concentrations. We included a link to the website. So I know that a few of you actually took a look at some of the deadlines that have been approaching for current students. So I know you guys are physicians in training right now um, and you're kind of onboarding with us, but um, that will slowly start giving you more information about how to get involved in our scholarly concentration very soon. So stay tuned. Um, so that said, um, one question that I have for everyone is what are some challenges faced during M1 um, regarding the demands that you guys have really faced in med school? Um, you know, how much have you had to study? How much have you had to, um, you know, overcome them? Can anyone kind of talk to us about sort of like the rigors that you faced and kind of how you've overcome some of those challenges? So I can kind of go ahead and answer this one because I wasn't trying to type this one out. So I was in the middle of trying to answer this one. But um, yeah, what I was going to say is that during M1, I'd say one of the biggest challenges is just learning how to adjust your studying and your scheduling. So really, no matter how much you think you've prepared yourself in undergrad, it's it's gonna take some change and adjustment, whether it be for learning, time management or self-care, there's gonna be some form of adjustment needed because it is a very different experience from what most people are used to. So I'd say one of the best things to do is try to schedule self-care for yourself because sometimes there's always gonna be something you feel like you didn't study enough or you didn't do enough. So a lot of times people will just study right through self-care and kind of lose themselves in their studying. So a great recommendation I had before I started was schedule a two hour or three hour block for yourself every week that cannot be touched by schoolwork. So you can put hobbies there, you can put fitness there, just something other than schoolwork in order to essentially keep your sanity. And that's really important. Um, to overcome some of the struggles, I'd say some of your best resources are your colleagues. You're all going through it together and it's this crazy feeling of community when you're with a giant struggling group, to be frank. So everyone's in it together and you can bounce study ideas off of them, see what they're doing. If you feel like what you're doing isn't working, kind of uh, form study groups together. I know a lot of people use Anki and they'll make decks together. 
So basically you have your colleagues to help you, um, just make sure you have self-care going on. And then also you're gonna have your upperclassmen that are more than happy to give you advice on how we got through it as well. Sounds great. So we're kind of approaching the end of our time here. And so what I would love for all of you to do, and um, certainly just take a few moments to do this uh, for each and every one of you, but if you had to give everybody one bit of advice um, as an incoming student, what would that be? Um, so if you guys can go ahead and each one of you kind of give us your impression, uh, I think that'd be really great to close us out. Um, so how about we go backwards now? So Maggie, how about you start us off? Um, I would say, this was actually asked, uh, asked in the chat, but do not study before you start medical school. Use this time to just like relax because you will be studying for the rest of your life. <laughs> so like really just take this time to relax, like do some COVID safe traveling, you know. Thank you. Uh, Daniel. Um, I would say, especially if you're coming to Wayne, which I hope you do, um, definitely take the opportunity to get involved in things. Um, this school offers plenty of opportunities that just like, quite frankly, no other school can offer just because of our size, our location, our faculty. There's just so many great ways to get involved in whatever you want here um, and definitely take advantage of it. Um, it's great to do things beyond the classroom and really get like a well-rounded experience that um, really prepares you for the next step. Um, also, just keep an open mind. Um, I came into med school not having any idea of what I wanted to do, and I'm going to be going to the psych next year, which was not at all on my radar going in, and I'm very excited about it. It's like the perfect fit for me, and um, if I didn't have an open mind, I may not have ended up on this career choice. Um, so definitely keep an open mind and just explore what's out there. Perfect. Very clear. Yeah. I, um, I just want to echo the congratulations. I hope that you decide to come to Wayne. I have had a fantastic experience here. Um, something I would say is um, remember that you're a human being, not a human robot. Take the next three months before you start med school to really reflect on what makes you feel human. Because if you lose touch because you're spending so much time studying, you're going to have a really hard time interacting with your patients that are human beings and have human struggles. So stay in touch with your humanity and remember that you're a human and things are hard sometimes and things are happy sometimes and being in med school is what you wanted. And, and at the end of the day, you're working towards a goal that, that you've wanted for a very long time. So remember that and um, good luck. Thank you for those great words. And Lauren? Just remember to have fun. Like, I know it's going to be stressful and I know there's a lot of studying to do, but this is truly a once in a lifetime experience. There's not a lot of people who are able to say you, they went through medical school. You're going to feel like you have to study all weekend. You're going to have to feel like you have to study immediately after exam, go out with your friends after exams, de-stress, have fun on the weekends. It doesn't have to be a constant robot struggle like Maria was saying, okay? <laughs> make sure you have fun and you make memories and you enjoy it. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope you found our medical students as inspiring um, to me as they are to you. Um, and, uh, one to, and to kind of echo kind of what everybody's been saying here, congratulations and welcome to the Warrior MD family. Uh, we hope that we can see you soon. Um, and with that said, I'm gonna transfer it back over to Megan. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to thank our presenters for helping to fill out what it uh, what it means to engage in medical education here at Wayne State. Um, and I appreciate I truly appreciate our current students for highlighting their experience here. I think that gives you a great sense of what what the student experience is like. Um, and I, I really appreciate everyone's engagement here today. Uh, we had a lot of great questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll send out responses to those questions as well. So um, when the webinar ends, we will, we will preserve those answers and get them out to you. And there are some questions that did not get answered live while we were here, but we'll make sure we get answers to those um, and send them out to you as well. Um, Moving forward, please be sure to connect with us on social media. Um, so follow our follow our social media channels and then connect with each other using the class of 2026 Facebook page. Um, please complete the class of 2026 checklist. We'll be updating that monthly um, to keep you on task with all the things you need to do to be ready to start here. 
Um, and then finally, we're super excited to uh, invite you to come to in-person tours on Fridays. So um, between now and June, we'll be offering in-person tours here on Fridays. Um, it's a great chance to come and see the campus for yourself. So I hope that you'll be able to take advantage of that as well. Um, that is our program for the day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to welcoming you here uh, in July as well. Have a good one.